Andrew and I have put together a tutorial for you on supercharged nerve transfers. As we're all aware, we're challenged with nerve injuries and really for four major reasons and in four major situations. When a nerve injury is proximal and far away from the muscle target, we'll have poor regeneration. If the timing between the injury and the repair is delayed, we'll have poor regeneration. If we have to bring a graft into the situation and have nerves regenerate across a um, nerve graft, we'll have poor regeneration. And if we don't know what the topography is as far as sensory and motor, we'll have poor regeneration. So in all four of these situations, nerve transfers in general will help us to avoid those. We know the topography, we're getting close to target, getting close to target and avoiding a graft will allow us to help with any delay or proximal injury. And by doing these nerve transfers, we can avoid this uh, situation of the irreversible atrophy that happens around the 12 month period. By doing a nerve transfer far from the injury, we can help with this timing of the, of the delay and the distance. And when we understand topography, which is all about how nerve transfer started, then we can line up our nerves so we're getting sensory motor specific uh, regeneration. Nerve transfers have been done, however, really for just fourth and fifth complete ner nerve uh, injuries. Andrew and I spent some time a few years ago doing the mathematics for the size of the cell body or the neuron and how far it would project as axon. Tom Drucker, a neurosurgeon from Baltimore, uh, once said that he, he did his height and then expanded the distance. I did I took his idea and would say something like, if I'm my cell body is five foot six like I am, I would project my um, cells, uh, nerve fibers all the way out to my fingertips, which, which would be eight miles. So anyway, we did the math with the height of the gateway arch in St. Louis. It was a fun kind of thing to do. But when you do that, you can project an axon a very long way. And in this situation, we cartooned it out to Anchorage, Alaska. So imagining you have an injury at the US-Canada border and you repair it there, no matter what you repair it with, it's just really too far to expect any result with looking after those poor people in Anchorage, Alaska. By contrast, if you do a nerve transfer and you can steal what you want from Fairbanks, Alaska, and you can avoid the nerve grafts and that distance in time, you would expect that the people in Anchorage are gonna be a lot happier receiving things from Fairbanks than they are from the US-Canadian border. And that huge difference that you can just see pictorially here is what we see with the results with nerve transfers. In 1982, I started my clinical practice at the University of Toronto, and this was one of the earlier patients that I did with uh, Alan Hudson, chairman of neurosurgery at University of Toronto, who taught me so much about nerve grafting. And you can see those long nerve grafts in this patient with our blue and yellow background, a graft going down towards the biceps, a graft going over towards the uh, axillary nerve. And about three years later, this was his result. I took this picture. It's a little bit grainy over the decades. You can see his long incision. And I thought this was a great result. He could bend his elbow up. But when you look at his eyes, you can see that perhaps, well, for sure, he's not impressed with that result. So this is an upper brachial plexus injury. Same upper plexus injury. And this patient who's had a thoracodorsal to axillary nerve transfer and a medial pectoral, pectoral to musculocutaneous nerve ends, uh, transfer, much better result, much happier patient and surgeons. So we have to go back every time. If there's one thing that you need to own is a good understanding of the classification of nerve injury. Can't emphasize this enough. We've uh, uh, simplified this a little bit just recently to favorable injuries and unfavorable injuries. So if you look over in the far left, uh, you see Sutton's, uh, Sunderland's um, 1 to 5, and Sutton's neuropraxia, axonotomesis, and neurotomesis. And if a favorable 1 would be the neuropraxia, so great result fast. A favorable 2 would be uh, the axonotomatic injury, uh, second degree Sunderland, where you would get a great result, but it would take forever. A uh, third degree would be pretty good result. Sunderland three, take a long time. And then a fourth and fifth would be the unfavorable, neurotomatic injuries per sudden and no result. 
Now, what you want to know is you may you know know all these operations to do, but you want to know when are you going to do them. And the way to um, decide when you're going to operate is, well, when is this distinction made for you between a favorable get better injury and a non-favorable not get better injury? And that is 12 weeks. That's a critical time to make a decision as whether you're going to operate or not. By 12 weeks, there should be evidence of collateral sprouting, uh, motor unit potentials into the distal muscle if you've got a axon automatic injury that will recover. Around four to six weeks when the axon's been injured, you'll see the fibrillations. But you'll see those in the axon automatic injuries and the neurotomatic injuries. It's that 12-week mark where you see a split between the unfavorable injuries that are not going to show you any motor unit potentials and the injuries that will recover, the axonotomatic injuries that will recover where you'll see motor unit potentials. Those motor unit potentials aren't normal. They're collateral sprouting. They're not regenerating motor unit potentials. They're axons that haven't been injured that are now kind of waking up and collaterally sprouting into the adjacent muscle. Later on, you'll see a uh, uh, nascent units or nascent motor units, and those are the injured axons that are, are sprouting. But the configuration between a normal motor unit that you'd see in the first degree or neuropraxia is very different than what a nascent motor unit looks like or a collateral sprouting motor unit. And note here, these are all acute injuries. Over time, the fibrillations will go away and the configuration of the motor units will change to be chronic pattern. You'll be looking at your electrodiagnostic report from your neurologist and you can work with them and talk to them and they'll tell you the different types of, of motor units that are coming back. But in general, what you want to do for a uh, nerve transfer end to end is do those nerve transfers at three months or four on the injuries that are not going to get better. No motor units at three or four months, you're never really going to get a satisfactory result without um, doing something operative. And the indications for nerve transfers, we've been through this, we know it, it's uh, for injuries that aren't going to recover, your donor should be expendable, it should be as many motor units as you can get together without downgrading any other function, if possible have the uh, motor fibers synergistic so the motor re-education is easier, you want to get to that those motor lead-in fibers as close to tar target as possible. So fourth and fifth degree injuries, unfavorable injuries, three or four months, end-to-end -end nerve transfers. Supercharged nerve transfers. These are meant for the axonotomatic injuries, the injuries that are going to give you back potential recovery. You're not going to know if it's going to be full recovery as it would be a second degree injury or partial recovery as a third degree injury. And really we're doing these supercharges for those partial of recoveries, third degree, or situations where you've got a very high axonotomatic injury and you want to protect the motor end plates so that as that second degree injury recovers, where all those axons are able to recover, they're coming back to a favorable, favorable muscle environment. So we are proposing supercharged nerve transfers for these second and third degree injuries. Uh, we've done these nerve transfers predominantly uh, for ulnar intrinsic uh, muscle recovery. That's where our greatest experience is. And that's what I'm going to put a little bit of time in to talk to you about that in some detail. For a, a handful of other um, second degree injuries, radial nerve posterior interosseous, musculocutaneous, um, some of the nerves around the shoulder, we've done a few uh, supercharges for those. but many operations on patients where we're trying to get ulnar intrinsic function. So back to that same uh, cartoon, the same injury at the US Canadian border. In this situation, it's not a fourth or fifth degree injury at the US Canadian border, it's a second or third degree injury. So we anticipate potential for recovery, but we want to add to it by doing a nerve transfer, but not an end to end and end to side so that we can mingle together those two recoveries, the recovery from the proximal original injury, and then add to that something in a supercharged fashion. 
So I'm going to leave this uh, slide up here for a few moments. And Andrew and I have uh, spent a fair bit of time discussing back and forth about how to present this. This is the first time we presented it in this tabular format, so it may change, but we're pretty happy with this. So let me say then the supercharges, as we've done dozens and dozens of, is to try to recover ulnar intrinsic function. It's a good nerve injury to start with because the literature would suggest that if you have a high acute transection injury on your ulnar nerve, you will not get back ulnar intrinsic function. So if someone has something to offer for some type of ulnar intrinsic recovery, then people are ready for that. So we've divided it into acute and chronic type of problems. Cubital tunnel is where we've had a lot of experience, patients with uh, horrible uh, ulnar intrinsic atrophy. There's lots of cubital tunnel situations like that. We have a large number of patients there. But let's start with the acute injuries. So if you have a high ulnar nerve injury, and at 12 weeks you're starting to see some motor unit potentials that show collateral sprouting pattern. That means you've got a second or third degree injury. It will get better to some degree. Who knows how much? And who knows how long it's going to take because it's so high. Well, you do know how long it's going to take. It's going to take quite a while. So in those patients, we believe that they're ideal candidates for a, a, a supercharge down at the wrist, nine centimeters or so proximal to the wrist, you transfer the anterior interosseous nerve to the side of the motor component of the ulnar nerve and, and add those six to 900 AIN nerve fibers into the ulnar intrinsic fibers, but expecting that high ulnar nerve, second and third degree injury with fibrillations and motor unit potentials present at 12 weeks to mingle together to give you a better result. If it's a fourth and fifth degree injury, there's fibrillations, and if there's no motor unit potentials, then that's an indication for the traditional and decide anterior interosseous nerve to deep motor branch of the ulnar nerve. The first time I did that, AIN end to end deep motor branch of the ulnar nerve was April the 23rd of 1991. And since then, for high complete ulnar nerves injuries, that's the transfer I do. The results are okay, they're not spectacular, but they're certainly better than nothing. And I think that operation has found its place in management of high ulnar nerve uh, injuries. Now, in that same injury, if you've transected your ulnar nerve high, but the patient has a Martin Gruber, then the electrical studies at 12 weeks uh, will show fibrillations, but they'll also show normal motor units. They'll show normal motor units at, at a week or whenever because those motor units are coming from the median. So if you stimulate the median nerve and record off the ulnar intrinsics, you'll see normal motor units. That's how you know you've got a Martin Gruber. So in those situations, you do not want to do an end-to-end -end AIN to deep motor branch because you would lose those nerve fibers coming in from the median nerve. So in those situations, it's an ideal situation to do an end-to-side rather than an end-to-end -end so that you don't lose or give up the input from the median nerve. Well, that's the black situation where you have a high ulnar nerve situation. What about the gray zones? So it's at the elbow in a young person, or it's a little distal to the elbow in an older person. So in the mid ulnar injuries, and you can make your own de decision about where you would call mid, I would say elbow distal. In those situations, there is potential, if you do a primary repair or a nerve graft at that level, that you'll get intrinsics back. It's unlikely in an older person, but it might be possible for the gray. We're calling it mid ulnar levels, but maybe a, a better term would be the gray situation where you're really not sure if you should go end to end or end to side, but you think given the age or the repair or the injury that there's really a good possibility that you can anticipate recovery in your ulnar intrinsics, but you're not totally sure. Those would be a good situation for a supercharge end to side as well. So the largest area we've operated on is cubital tunnel. And these patients that get a SETS or a supercharge and to side nerve transfer, they all have awful ulnar intrinsic function. But it's not just from a, a demyelinating conduction block at the elbow. So you can have slowing at the elbow, but if you look over to the amplitude where the neurologist will be measuring amplitude, if the amplitude is good, that means that the 
fibers that they're doing conduction measurements across the elbow are demyelinated, but you haven't lost fibers. But if the amplitude is decreased, then you know you, that you've, lost, you've got a significant axonal component as well. So in the chronic cubital tunnel, where you have ulnar intrinsic atrophy, we want to see fibrillations or not. So if it's all chronic, you won't see um, fibrillations, but it's, it's a better situation if you can see fibrillations. That means you've got some motor end plates that will uh, potentially receive these supercharged. And the motor units will look different than in the acute injuries. They'll be chronic motor units. They've got a different pattern. If you have fibrillations, which means a um, axonal injury, and you don't have motor units in a, a cu in a cubital tunnel situation, if you have those fibrillations, then it means there's going to be some motor end plates that you could potentially supercharge to. So I guess what I'm saying is, with cubital tunnel, this could be this will be a redo cubital tunnel often. There's a, a chronic nerve compression with maybe a, an acute injury from a kink or um, um, another injury at the at the um, at the elbow or super uh, superimposed situations at Guillain's canal. Your electrical studies should show some fibrillations, and you will or will not have motor units present depending on the severity of it. In a situation where you have fibrillations and chronic motor units present, you're more likely to get back recovery of good ulnar intrinsic function than if you don't have motor units. But as long as you've got fibrillations, I think it's reasonable to go for that supercharge. So nerve transfers again are for an end-to-end -end for fourth and fifth degree injuries. I think people are very familiar with that. And we've discussed when we would do that, and that would be an acute injury, high, no Martin Gruber. Supercharge. The supercharge um, procedure here is cartooned. And again, the donor is in green, meaning good, go green. And the recipient, not so good. That would be stop, red or, or pink. And uh, people have been doing these nerve transfers since the 1800s, 1900s. So that's not particularly new. What was new for us were our transgenic rats whose axons fluoresce green. And we looked at this idea in the lab. Actually, our hypothesis was that it wouldn't really work well, that you couldn't take a healthy perineal nerve and sew it to the side of a completely denervated tibial nerve and have those nerve fibers grow inside that nerve. So we did this study, you can see across the top, day zero, time of surgery, and then three, seven, 10, 35 days. Distally um, is at the bottom, tibial nerve is over to the right in each of those panels. And if you look at day seven, you can see some of those perineal nerve fibers breaking inside the nerve. At day three, there's some spotty bits of green still left in that tibial nerve. That's the fluorescence of the denervated axons being uh, picked up by macrophages. By day seven, you have a pretty black looking denervated tibial nerve. But look at day 10, you're starting to see that perineal nerve grow right inside the nerve. Now it's interesting just to observe that the perineal nerve is a mixed nerve. It has motor fibers and sensory fibers. And the sensory and motor fibers are going inside that nerve. And just as an aside, we started to do some supercharged sensory nerve transfers for high injuries just in the same sort of recipe as we would do for high uh, motor. For example, taking the palmar cutaneous branch of the median nerve and transferring it into the uh, ulnar nerve sensory at the wrist and also doing side to side bridges from the median nerve to the side of the denervated ulnar sensory branch. Because these, all of these fibers are going down that nerve. And if you look at day 35, that perineal nerve is regenerated straight down that tibial nerve. It's full of green nerve fibers and they're all coming from the perineal nerve. It was pretty amazing for me to see this. In fact, we did this experiment twice just because we found it incredible. If you look at that last day 35, you can also see there's a little uh, tip of perineal nerve moving proximally, but not much. It has messages distally. It knows that it's got to go distally, not proximally. And if you count distally the number of nerve fibers, either when we did a control end-to-end -end or the reverse end-to-side or supercharge, you can see there's exactly the same number of nerve fibers 
when we take the perineal nerve end to end of the tibial, about 3,000, or we take the perineal nerve to the side of the tibial, about 3,000. So the same number of nerve fibers are, are breaking through that epineurium and perineurium to get into that nerve. And please note, we open up widely the epi and the perineurium to allow those nerves to get inside that nerve. We did another study where we were looking at what would happen when, happen when we mingled the two nerves together. So in that first study, we prevented anything from coming down the tibial nerve. If you do a nerve graft in the tibial nerve, you never, in a rat, you never get normal recovery. So we use this as a partial recovery model. Instead of calling it partial injury model, we should call it partial recovery model because we did make a complete injury on the tibial nerve and graft it, but we anticipate some recovery. So we use that as a model for a second or third degree injury. And the same thing, we showed the perineal nerve into the tibial nerve, distal close to target, and we did that short graft as proximal as we could get on the tibial nerve. Now here on the partial recovery is in blue, that's the amount of force we got back in that muscle. And when we added to that partial recon to that when we added to that reconstruction of the tibial nerve, the added perineal nerve component, you see we got statistically more muscle force than if we had just done that proximal nerve reconstruction on the tibial nerve. So it gave us a better result when we supercharged it. Then we cut the donor. So we cut that perineal nerve supercharge to get rid of that input and looked at what our force was and it dropped but I was surprised to see it didn't drop down to the baseline of what the repair alone on the tibial nerve would give you. And, and when, we, when this was presented at lab meeting, it was, we were like frowning, like, what is, how is, what's going on there? Like, why don't we, when we take out the supercharge component, which, which was a perineal, why don't we drop right down to the baseline of what the tibial reconstruction alone would give? And I think the reason for that is that those perineal nerve fibers getting into that tibial muscle quicker is making that environment better for the tibial native tibial nerve axons when they reach target. So the tibial, the perineal nerve is babysitting, and when the parents come home, they're coming home to a happier environment, if you would call the tibial axons parents and the perineal nerve babysitting. So based on that experimental work, we started to do the supercharge for this problem here, ulnar intrinsic atrophy. And the anterior interosseous nerve, which we had lots of familiarity with doing the AIN end to end to the motor branch of the ulnar nerve, we just took it to the side of the ulnar nerve. There's a couple of tricks with this. We follow the anterior interosseous nerve into the mid portion of the pronator quadratus. The pronator quadratus needs to be healthy. It has to be innervated and healthy. When you get to the mid portion of the pronator quadratus, the AIN branches into two or three branches, and we splay these little branches over the two or three fascicles that are within the group of the motor intrinsics. So we're opening up epipery around the motor component of the ulnar nerve so we can get these AIN nerve fibers into that motor. And here's the anatomy, which I think everyone's familiar with. It's the right hand, below will be the dorsocutaneous ulnar, and then the motor component of the ulnar nerve is sandwiched between the DCU sensory and the main sensory to the ring and half and, and small finger. If you take micro pickups and just tap across the main ulnar nerve, the micro pickups will drop into the cleavage plane between the sensory group and the motor group. The DCU comes off the ulnar nerve about 10 centimeters proximal to the wrist crease. The nerve transfer of the anterior interosseous nerves goes to the side of the motor component of the ulnar nerve about eight to nine centimeters proximal to the wrist crease. Make sure as you're bringing the anterior interosseous nerve across that it comes obliquely, not at a right angle turn. There's a little crossing vessel that you have to slide the AIN under and around or clip that vessel so that it come, comes directly across, not at a right angle turn. And you can see how lazy in that upper left panel labeled C, you can see how lazy that AIN is as it's coming over 
to the anterior interosseous nerve and in the upper right panel labeled D, a few nanomicros fanning the three branches of the AIN out over the motor component of the uh, ulnar nerve. In some of these cases, for example, the cubital tunnels, when you have a little bit of contraction in the ulnar nerve, you'll be able to stimulate that motor branch and see some contraction in the hand. So when you're doing this case, you may be doing this procedure with a redo cubital with a Guillain's canal release, but find your ulnar nerve quick. And as soon as you find your ulnar nerve, prox find it in the distal forum. If they do have a little bit of, say, first DI function, then do your dissection then on the ulnar nerve because you can use nerves, the nerve stimulator to help confirm to you, especially when you're starting to do this, what the topography is. And it'll save you a lot of time and give you a lot of confidence. So here we are with the result. This is, I think this is our first case. This fellow had complete ulnar intrinsic atrophy. He'd had uh, previous ulnar nerve transposition procedures. Couldn't golf. He was miserable, frustrated, not a happy guy at all. And um, here's his result one year later. These results get better to two and three and four years. And I'm very happy with this SETS procedure in patients with ulnar intrinsics down some function, but really lousy function in the ulnar intrinsics, especially with people with failed cubital tunnel. So thank you very much. I think you'll like this procedure.